Welcome back to another episode of Vancouver Real, and welcome to the first day of the rest of your life. My name is Mike Zaremba, and I'm very happy to be at the helm here, uh, you know, host co-hosting this one with my brother Andy. Hello, everyone. Good to see you again, and I'm really glad you threw in the first day of the rest of your life quote, because, uh, well, we were inspired to throw that in at the beginning of the podcast, thanks to a mutual friend of ours, Mr. Don Howard Lawler. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it's after a, a, a retreat we both did. Uh, maybe 2017, I think it was. Yes, we came back and we're like, and right, oh, right before, you know, we enter the uh, the uh, Maloka. He pokes, pokes pokes his head out and he's like, "Welcome to the first day of the rest of your life, <laughs> brothers and sisters. Come on in." And yeah. you go in and you drink wachuma, which is amazing, and mm-hmm. it really does. It's like that's that one. It sticks with you, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it really does kind of affect the way you see the world afterwards. So yep. that's why we adopted that, and of course, we adopted the center for uh, healing and higher consciousness too yeah That's so we're we were podcasting got the inspiration here. for that as well that's right we're podcasting out of float house at 70 west cordova street in downtown vancouver bc canada floathouse.ca is our website and uh, if you want to try floating you can uh, use the promo code vancouver real and save 20 percent um and i'm going to just kind of dive right into our uh, our guest today because it's a it's a very special guest mm-hmm. coming from out of town fresh off the slopes in uh, whistler Looks like you had a lot of fun out there. So good. Dr. Dan Engel is in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Good to be with you guys. This is epic, man. Yeah, uh, I'm absolutely. so glad you're here. Yeah. Like, yep. honestly, it's like having those kindred spirits come in and actually be in center. It's like, it's so much better than Skype. Mm-hmm. Our yes. last interview, the audio wasn't of the best quality, admittedly, but uh, this one will be much better. So, yeah. Thanks so, for coming in. Thanks for coming absolutely. in. Absolutely. Squeezing yeah. us in. Uh, and I did a, a, a Skype interview as well. The first one, a couple of years ago, I'd say. Um, and he did one not too long ago, but having you here in person is fantastic. Um, and if you haven't heard those episodes or are not familiar with Dr. Dan, Dr. Dan is a, a psychiatrist by, uh, I guess, professions, but he's uh, got his fingers in a lot of different pools right now, which is really cool. And there's a lot to dive into. Um, you know, you do uh, lectures and consult globally as a medical director of the Revive Treatment Centers of America. That's like kind of a big project I see, um, I've been seeing on your social media being pushed out and we'll got, dive into that as well. You're also the medical advisor for Onnit Labs um, and True Rest Float Centers. And you're, you're a very experienced floater and uh, speak very highly of that in terms of how it can integrate for mental health concerns. So probably dive into that as well. Um, you also have uh, your first book published in October of 2017 called The Concussion Repair Manual. Um, Was that your first? Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. And so that's at uh, concussionrepairmanual.com, and you can download that uh, or get it through Amazon and Indigo, I think, and Barnes & Noble I saw mm-hmm. on there. So yeah. definitely check all that out. Once you, once you dive into Dr. Dan, you're going to want to explore everything else. And drdanangle.com is probably the main hub, but long-winded, but welcome officially to Vancouver Real again. Yeah, excellent. It's good to be with you guys Absolutely. right in the belly of the beast here in that's beautiful right. Vancouver. Yeah. So what brings up the Vancouver uh, well, a couple of things. One is to ski Whistler and yeah. Blackcomb. Oh, yeah. my gosh. So good. <laughs> Even in minus 20 to 30 degrees up on top of the mountain and getting a little bit of frostbite on my nose. Is that what's crazy. going on there? I, but, I thought maybe yeah. a bad sunburn, but you got frostbitten, eh? Yeah. Whoa. Well, it was a little bit of both. Because right. the Wind week burn. before, I was in Breckenridge. And that's where the first few layers got taken off and then the rest of it got taken off up at the top of Whistler. And it was just such a beautiful time. 8,000 acres to explore. And we covered about 90,000 vertical feet in about three days. Wow. That's insane. It's going hard. I I went, luckily I had the opportunity to connect with some of the locals, including um, this really brilliant guy named Don McQuaid. Hmm. And uh, he showed me all around the, the first day and just got me, uh, boots on the ground. Um, another friend, uh, Pete uh, Depoy, put us in touch with each other, and so it's good to just get to know some of the locals here yeah. in in Vancouver and up on the hills, cool. and um, get my uh, get my Dude. sea legs back on the snowboard because it's yeah. been about 20 years. Oh, I've wow. spent most of that time in the jungle, so I don't think my nose and my, the rest of my body is acclimated yet. Totally from jungle weather to like sub zero <laughs> yeah. Arctic Alpine. weather. Yeah, the tundras. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no so, doubt, no doubt. Well, that's yeah. really cool. That's very yeah. cool. And well, then to catch up with uh, Curtis Christofferson okay. through uh, Innovative Fitness. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I've definitely seen him online uh, with his Innovative Fitness, and he's a local guy here. And um, So you're doing uh, uh, some speaking with, with him or something? Yeah, we do a talk tonight and then cool. a small group deep dive uh, this weekend. Fantastic. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and speaking of the jungle, you are another Spirit Quest Sanctuary alumni, and that's... Uh, Absolutely. We, we all got connected. Well, that's what we heard of you originally through like Aubrey and that whole world and everything. Yep. And we wanted to give a shout out to uh, Parker Sherry, who's now running the place down yeah. there for Don Howard as he's going through his treatments and everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a place that's the thing it's like when you go to Peru you really want to know who you're going to be diving into the plant medicines with so uh, Spirit Quest is the one that I will consistently recommend to people mm -hmm. and uh, like it's like the pinnacle I don't, I don't know I haven't actually it's the only place I've been but it seems like it's done amazingly well and it's the only place I'll go while they're still open I think just because I have such a high level of trust for them but mm -hmm. I know you've passed through there before and, oh yeah and uh, had yeah some, I had the opportunity to sit yeah. with Don Howard in three of his three of his masadas Mm -hmm. And then his pilgrimage, the last oh, pilgrimage nice. that he did, where we you go to all of the ancient sites and then end up at Chavin, right? Which is like um, you know, one of those Aztec-looking kind of temples and pyramids where where San Pedro is essentially birthed. Right. Yeah. So it's it's um, lineage goes all the way back to these temples. <clears throat> where they would receive the Wachuma in the courtyard, and then you would go into the catacombs, receive the Vilca, and then you would go in to see the Lanzon, which is this really big, beautiful, um, like 10-ton... It's an obelisk, granite. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's like, I think they consider it an Axis Mundi, right? So it's like... Yeah, yeah. right. The Axis Mundi is the, essentially the center of the world. Yeah. Yeah, so everything res res revolves and um, s emanates from that... Mm place in that iconography, in that kind of cosmology with Huachuma and San Pedro being the gateway and the doorway. Mm. And when you look back, this is one of the things I love so much about Don Howard is he's the living lineage holder for San Pedro and Huachuma, understanding where they come from, what the meaning was for that entire bioregion. So the thousand years that spanned 400 AD to 1400 AD in that entire region on the like the left sh upper shoulder of South America, no archaeological record of war. Right. Because a lot of people were receiving the San Pedro and opening up their heart and getting reconnected to one another and the planet and living in a more cooperative, peaceful way. Mm. Thousand years. And then the Spanish came in and then everything kind of went to hell. Right. <laughs> right. After yeah. that. Well, well I think, that I think he said like, yeah, being the center of the world, like Chavin Howard has gone, uh, he's told us before, like Chavin literally means the center of centers, right? Mm. It's such a, it's such a cool kind of concept there. Even think about that for a second, the center of centers, yeah. but yeah. And like, and Don Howard, he's going through some, uh, some medical treatments now in the U S um, but they've reopened their retreat center down there at spirit quest, um, biopark.org is the website. And so they're just trying to keep it going down there. And mm -hmm. so, um, if you haven't heard about that, because they, they did shut down retreats for a while. I was actually fortunate enough to attend the very last uh, retreat with Don Howard, which was wow. very special, watching him drink Wachuma for potentially his final time, mm -hmm. uh, at least with a, with you know a retreat group, because I think he did it after that, but uh, and with his family as well. So, But they're back up and running, doing ayahuasca retreats right now, and then I think potentially doing um, uh, Wachuma uh, with his daughter potentially leading things that he, mm -hmm. she's been apprenticing for the last year and a half or so. So yeah. um, biopark.org, we want to kind of have that little chat just to support Parker Sherry down there and, and yeah, Don Howard Parker's as well. Yeah, such a good guy too. I got to meet him with Aubrey in Sedona. And... Um, he his energy is a lot like Don Howard. Mm. Interesting. Physically, he looks similar to Don Howard. He does. Too. Like, like a wow, really young Don that's Howard. That's really interesting. And he was so giving. You know, just believed so much in the medicine, believed so much in the lineage. He was so right. giving, offering up um, his own you know healing support for Don Howard's recovery. Yeah. Right. And, and speaking of the work that they do there, I, a lot of people are very familiar with ayahuasca. But uh, Wachuma seems to be a lot less known, um, and Vilca even less known than that. Yeah. So maybe you could give people a run through, like what is Wachuma or San Pedro? Like what's going mm -hmm. on there? Like what's it used for? And maybe that's a good jump off point for you to start. Sure. Yeah, San Pedro is the South American cousin to peyote in the North America. So peyotes, you know, most people know what that looks like, these small little button cactuses. Peyote goes, grows so small that... In about 30 years, it would be about two inches tall and about two inches in um, diameter. Right. 
That's after about, and that's a mature cactus, right? right? Versus San Pedro grows in these really tall stalks. And after that long, you would have 10 plus feet of cactus. Yeah. And the reason that they're cousins is they share the primary alkaloid mescaline. And the mescaline experience is pretty similar between the two, although the lineages from peyote medicine and San Pedro or Wachuma. Wachuma is the original name, and then it got, and then it got turned into San Pedro, which um, stands for St. Peter, holding the keys to the pearly gates, so to speak, mm. of heaven. And the, the lineages between those two medicines is very different, but the medicines themselves are quite similar because mescaline, being the chief alkaloid of both, lasts about 10 to 12 hours, and it really gives you this... Um, upper and middle world kind of process whereas aya is a very lower world process really sing- you know it's also aya is done in the dark it's typically done um in group settings but in isolation so to speak in that mm-hmm. you're on your own tombo right. and you get work done by the facilitators who come around the circle whereas san pedro's done in the daytime socially very communal so it gives you this middle world relational experience and it really at the higher doses or when people are really opened up it can really give you a sense of oneness and a connection to the upper worlds and like the sense of all that is that's a very good description of it actually i really appreciate that because yeah like you can have that very um camaraderie bonding very tight bonding experience and that's cool yeah you're right that's that is a middle world type experience and then i had personally a, a huge upper world opening on one of my uh, ceremonies with Don Howard and just like, it was almost like overwhelming how Mm -hmm. incredible it felt. (laughs) But, uh, um, and then obviously, you know, that leads into the later parts of the day and it's, it's quite a long ceremony. Right. And, and, and the, I find the, the ending hours of it to be really interesting sometimes, like just kind of the state that you get into and the connection you get into, especially when you're working with his Mesa, which is his big altar table that Don Howard has. <laughs> his which incredible. altar is incredible. Yeah, it's, it's insane. It's insane. For people that aren't maybe as well versed in shamanism as the three of us are at this table, um, w- could you describe to people what is the difference between, say, lower, upper, and middle war- worlds and what that represents in the, mm-hmm. in the plane? Maybe even tie place? that in psychologically too. Yeah, sure. So I think of the lower world as being uh, more of a soul level experience, subconscious material deep into the trenches, so to speak. Oftentimes that includes trauma work where you're helping to get current from all of the past stuff that we haven't maybe even known that was there. Because at any given time, depending on the research you look at, there's between one and 10 or so percent of what's going on in the mind is conscious. The rest is subconscious. And so when all of that has the opportunity to get expressed or a good chunk of it or like the the next thing that's on top has an opportunity to get expressed, sometimes that's trauma related. Sometimes it's what we've been shoving away or not ready to look at or, or we didn't have the resources or the awareness to know how to deal with it. So it was just more convenient to put it in the closet. Mm-hmm. When that comes up, then we have the opportunity to become more whole. Because our trauma is just another part of ourselves that oftentimes has been disconnected or that we've been disconnected from because at the time of that trauma, maybe it was too overwhelming to understand how to, to work with. Would you also call that shadow work as well, mm-hmm. potentially? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So oftentimes I, I think of the, the lower world experience being more of like the soul. Mm-hmm. The upper world being more of the spirit, mm-hmm. right? And so this can be our direct connection to the source of all that is, name of a thousand names, God, creator, source, etc., and the middle world being more relational and being more like this 3D boots on the ground here today, so to speak. And um, when I think of bringing all those three worlds together, there are certain medicines that happen, that help us tap, tap into each of those. For example, DMT, very upper world medicine. <laughs> it's not very lower. It's not very middle. It's very upper. Right. Psilocybin, pretty middle world medicine, except at the higher doses, kind of like with San Pedro, the higher dose is very upper world. And at times it can be lower world too, like you start to work through the shadow and the trauma mm-hmm. stuff. Right. Aya typically is more of a lower world. Ketamine is typically more of a lower world in a sense because it's, it's, it's a dissociative. So it gives us this really interesting observational platform. Right. And that, that um, cosmology, that hierarchy, so to speak, um, that's based in a lot of different traditional cultures. Um, 
even the Andean teachings, when you're looking at the Chicana, um, the Chicana shows these three different worlds, upper, middle, lower world. Uh, the anaconda is oftentimes associated with the lower world, right? And yes. that's very much associated with ayahuasca, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The condor is associated with the upper world, right? Because the condor, like the eagle, are able to fly high and see the bigger perspective. And the jaguar is very middle world. The jaguar is like king predator on land here in this like boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about all those different aspects of ourselves, we have subconscious, lower world. We have conscious, middle world, and we have super conscious, mm -hmm. upper right. world. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I find that uh, the more, I guess, and do you find there's a, a, an ordering to how people typically will work? Like when they're being introduced to, say, shamanic practices, whether it's with plant medicines or not, that typically you got to start in the lower world and kind of work your way through? Like, do you feel like it's the inner work first and then the relational work or those maybe can interchange a little bit and then you kind of transcend to the Jacob's Ladder higher, higher realms? Is that, yeah. Have you noticed that trend? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I have noticed that trend and I think for most people, if we haven't done a lot of introspection, personal development work, we haven't had a lot of facilitation to look in the closet, mm -hmm. to look in the dark mirror or into that shadow then oftentimes that's what's right on the surface. Mm. And so oftentimes people's first experience will be into the shadow material. Maybe not their first experience, but their first like healing deep dive. Right. Oftentimes people's first experience might be really blissful. And it's right. interesting, yeah. particularly with Aya, it's really interesting how that happens because it's like she she lures you in with this really she gives sweet you a, <laughs> entry, right? Gives you a nice big hug and, and then. <laughs> totally. And then it's time to get to work. Because mm -hmm. if she just, you know, really went at it the first experience, you might not come back. It's right? true. So she kind of like so invites you in and you know what's possible. Yeah. And then to do the deeper work there's the willingness to consistently show up yeah. to do what might be uncomfortable mm -hmm. in order to become more integrated, in order to become more whole. Mm -hmm. And um, let me also just say too, for people listening, if they want any more information on that like th that three level process, mm -hmm. there's a really good book called Soul Craft by Bill Plotkin. Cool. And he also speaks of that kind of three level process and the difference in between the two. And I haven't found many contemporary writers who write as well as he does cool. on that kind of cosmology. Amazing. Yeah. 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 I, that's how, that was my intro to ayahuasca for sure. Uh, for the first, um, oh, four ceremonies, because it was five when I was down there for my first time, almost nothing happened. And I wasn't exactly being super strict with the yeta, and I didn't realize the importance of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I had a little interesting conversation one night, and uh, sure enough, she gave me a, a, a warm hug that turned out to be just a bombardment of love energy. I don't know how to describe mm -hmm. it other than that, but it took over my whole conscious state of being. And I left there um, after my fist and I'd be like, wow, ayahuasca is amazing. This is the most amazing thing. And then the second time I went back, I just got hit by a train <laughs> it was just like the complete opposite and, and then after i went back after that i'm like oh my god do i have to drink this again like what if that happens again you know and then it's a little bit better so it gives you what you need that's what they say anyways yeah. right right the medicines don't give us what we want they give us what we need right consistently yeah and i find it so interesting um obviously someone from your background coming from medical psychiatry and then you went on a deep personal journey into the jungles did a lot of this work like a lot of this work um, from you can see that from our, our first uh, episode with you we talked a lot about that but just kind of how now you're integrating these different cosmologies really uh, you mm -hmm. know allopathic medicine kind of concepts and that Western approach but however it's 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 having this evolution and you're I think you're one of the forefront people you know Definitely. driving this yep. um, and I think a large part of that is within like the revived treatment centers like in the, in the kind of paradigms you're approaching there if from you know, I've seen a couple cool little, not uh, just like uh, informational videos on the Revive Treatment Centers. Can you maybe talk about that sort of integration model that you seem to be kind of one of the mm -hmm. ones spearheading? Yeah. Yeah, when I think of the opportunity that we have today, it's to codify the next system of medicine. The last hundred years has been allopathic medicine, right? To the exclusion, allopathic medicine has actively tried to exclude the other fields mm -hmm. or make them wrong or call them voodoo or Woo -woo. Yeah, yeah, snake oil. Yeah. And that includes their war against chiropractic medicine, naturopathic mm -hmm. medicine, uh, even Ayurvedic and uh, Chinese medicine. 
and we have and we have the opportunity now to bring in an integrative approach. In the last 15 or so years has been integrative medicine, holistic medicine, functional medicine. Definitely an improvement. Still fairly specific to physiology though. And, and the physical body is just one aspect of ourselves and our lives. We have the opportunity now to codify the new system of medicine, which is transformational medicine. Interesting. And what does that look like when you actually have a medical center where people come specifically to have transformational experiences and you track the data of healing that is downstream from those transformational experiences. So when we look at people's nervous system, so Revive is a neurologic recovery center. Two, two big arenas that I geek out on and I dove pretty deep into. One is psychedelic medical research like we've been speaking about and the other is neurocognitive restoration after traumatic brain injury and concussion. Mm. Mostly because I was healing myself from those when my neurology teaching physicians didn't know what to do. Because over the last 20 to 30 years, the summary statement has been, oh, you have a bonk on your head, you have a concussion, traumatic brain injury. Well, we can diagnose it, but we don't have great therapeutics for it. Mm. So we go home, get some rest, we hope it gets better. And that wasn't very comforting. So I went into the research and tried to find what are the the therapeutics and the supplementation and lifestyle changes that were necessary to bring my own brain back online. So at Revive, it is based in a combination of functional neurology from a chiropractic standpoint. The original um, founder of Revive, uh, he and I work closely together now, Josh Flowers. Uh, his backstory is real similar to mine in healing himself through functional neurology and a chiropractic approach after he got uh, hit by a car riding his bike, mm. face planted into the cement, was in a coma, wow. had to learn how to walk and talk and like get himself back online. Um, and when he and I met and we just had this really great synergy, uh, it was easy for me to pair with a chiropractor because the chiropractor was, was my first true mentor, Roger Bell in Portland, Oregon. And he and I just developed this great relationship and I, I, had, I developed a deep respect for chiropractic medicine. And there's four different branches of chiropractic medicine, at least in the States. Okay. And um, they don't all the time get along really well together. So oftentimes when people have an idea of chiropractic medicine, they may have a particular approach to chiropractic medicine that didn't work for them. Like some, some doctors are like crack them and stack them and you know, you just keep revolving <laughs> right. through this kind like of door. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus functional neurology is very much based in how to assess the nervous system's prime deficits, where the point of trauma and how do we heal that? Mm. And the functional therapeutics are really good. We use TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, hyperbaric oxygen, um, a rotational device cut, called a gyro stem where we can spin some pod, somebody in three different axes when we understand specifically where the trauma or the weakness is, we can stimulate that by spinning them in different axes. Really? Yeah, it's pretty good. Wow, dope. I had no idea. I saw that in the video, the guy spinning around. That's what around. that is. And I thought that was some sort of proprioception development sort of thing, trying to coach right. that up. But yeah. Wow, that's kind of interesting. And proprioception is another, so the sense of your, yourself in space, mm -hmm. right? That can get rehabilitated. That's typically through functional movement. Um, eye exercises or video nystagmography to be able to see where people's eyes are tracking. What's their reaction time? What's their executive function? So we work on all of those things as a foundation. And then they brought me on board to, to work in the infusion suite because Kairos can't do injections or infusions, okay. at least in the States. So we also do NAD drips, um, which essentially help. It's, it's, NAD is part of the cellular chain of energy in the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle right, for every right. single cell. Builds ATP, which is your, essentially your fuel source for, this, for the cell, cleans up the mitochondria. It's very uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. you get you get used to it over time. So we do NAD, ketamine therapy, uh, fast vitamin IVs, which is like Meyer cocktails, and that's level two. And then level three are stem cells and exosomes. So stem cells and exosomes have the greatest rehabilitative potential. All the other things I mentioned, those stimulate healing because they sense they stimulate synaptogenesis, which means mm -hmm. like the synapse synapses themselves have better 
communication and working um, functionality. But in order to stimulate cellular rehabilitation, the best therapeutics we know for that are stem cells and exosomes, which is still a very new science right. uh, to a certain degree, but that's where we're at. And so all of that that I just down or kind of laid out, that's all neurology okay. hardware. So if, if I'm thinking about how to help people up-level their entire operating system for life to get them fully connected to who they are and what they're here to do, I think of neurology and psychology. Neurology is the hardware. Psychology is the software. So if we look at neurologic regenerative medicine tools and then software psychologic consciousness tools, mm. once we bring those two fields together, then we have the best opportunity to really stimulate people's full healing potential. And those two under this umbrella of transformational medicine is what I see as being the future and the frontier of where we have the opportunity to go. Quick question on that. Um, have, have you, with uh, the neurological hardware side of it, um, are you able to work with people that have had, say, nerve damage issues for a long time? Or yeah. it has to be pretty fresh. Yeah. So Josh started Revive as essentially a WTF clinic. Like, a what the fuck clinic. <laughs> people have, like, they've tried everything else. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. And oftentimes, they've had symptoms for many years, at times decades. Okay. And they're essentially like, this is my last hope. Hmm. They've tried everything else, so let's do this thing. And I don't, and I'm yes, I'm a little biased, uh, but this may also be true. I don't know that there's another center in the country or potentially even in the Western Hemisphere that does what we do as well because our focus is specifically concussion recovery, traumatic brain injury, stroke, neurologic deficits. Over long periods of time, people come for two weeks at a time hmm. minimum to do a deep dive process. So we have people... Um, in a very intensive experience over six to eight hours a day. Wow. And we don't push them past their metabolic threshold because if you do too much, just because you have a lot you can do doesn't mean it's great to do all of that at once. Right. If you push people past their metabolic threshold, then you can make their symptoms worse. Right. So we have the opportunity to toggle that up and down and then see where they're able to go. And then oftentimes when we see people that have had functional deficits for years if not decades be able to get out of their wheelchair and walk again or this one woman for just i mean you know there's hundreds of case examples i could give you but this one woman just she stands out so strongly because her experience was so profound she had a stroke in her thalamus which is where you gate all of your pain information and so her thalamus was firing 24 7. she was cr constantly in pain for 24 7. crazy and the only thing that they knew how to do was give her opiates. So she took mm. truckloads of opiates. It really screwed up her digestive system. And it didn't really help her pain. So she came in and we offered her, I, offered, I gave her a shot of ketamine because ketamine, also, that's kind of a level two infusion suite thing that we use as well. Ketamine's a great um, pain reliever. It's actually background as an, as an anesthetic. Right. And it also helps to interrupt chronic um, treatment-resistant depression. So that small dose of ketamine was the first time in more than 10 years that she had been pain-free. Wow. And at that point, then we could get her into the functional suite of therapeutics and give her stem cells. Right. By the end of that day, she was smiling, giving people hugs, reading a newspaper, and her husband just came up to me afterwards and with tears in his eyes saying, this was our very last straw. Just this morning, wow. she was talking about suicide. Holy. Right. Oof. So when we have the opportunity to intervene yeah. at that level, it's pretty inspiring. Hmm. Yeah. And, and it's also, it builds confidence because we know we can work with a variety of different brain challenges and to up-level people's hardware and prep them. I just see, I see, you know, all healing, all, whether it's a head injury, cancer, chronic pain, digestive issues, et cetera. All of these are doorways into getting to understand more of who we are mm -hmm. um, as a human in this one precious life and how we can bring all of ourselves as current as possible to be able to heal the trauma from our past and that, at, at times even ancestral trauma because trauma gets passed on just like hair color and eye color. To heal the past, to come as current as we can, to get more clear on our future vision that is cooperative, that is 
like Charles Eisenstein says in, the, in his really good book called The More Perfect World Our Hearts Know as Possible. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's a really good book. Hmm. It's about being able to understand that we're all connected in this really beautiful life. And, and when we can heal the, the trauma from the past and we can get really c- clear on what we're here to do, then, it, then we're filled up with this sense of like inspiration to provide the best reciprocity or the best gift that we can give back to our brothers and sisters, to the communities like Don Howard has been right. doing, mm-hmm. and to the future generations to come. This complete holistic healing, right? From yeah. mind, body, spirit. Um, Micro, sp- macro, social. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically about ketamine. How does that uh, interrupt like depression or depression symptoms uh, and, and help people get out of that loop? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. We're, we're still learning that. You know, we're, we still don't exactly know how the antidepressants work. Right. Um, although, when you're looking at the larger double-blind placebo-controlled meta-analysis and reviews, de- antidepressants aren't that much more robust than even placebo. That's a side note conversation, but it's, it's an example that we're still learning a lot about neurochemistry and a lot about the medicines and how they work. What ketamine seems to do is it seems to interrupt this part of the the brain that's associated with the ego. And like Michael Pollan says in um, How to Change Your Mind, this default mode network is the address of the ego. It's kind of like where the ego lives. Ketamine seems to give a reset to this default mode network. And, And that is potentially how it's working neurologically. Existentially, it works as a dissociative. So it's not it's not a classic psychedelic. Hmm. It's been used for treatment-resistant depression for 30-odd years um, as an off-label because it's an anesthetic. But what surgeons noticed with people who had chronic depression going into surgery 30 years ago is that many people would come out of surgery under anesthesia with ketamine feeling better and having some resolution or a little improvement in their depression. So it got people curious. Hmm. The usual treatment process is six to 10 sessions. And at that point, most people will have a resolution of their depression for three to six months. These are just on average. There's a dose threshold at which you dose it milligrams per kilogram. And it seems to be that you get the biggest reset at the default mode at the higher doses with more of the dissociative experience. So you're not sitting on the rim, so to speak. Mm. Can you can you talk us about, uh, talk, tell us about the dissociative experience. I've personally never experienced ketamine, um, but I've heard that basically it like lets you see everything from a distance. And yeah. I don't really, under, I can't explain it better than that because I've never experienced it, but can right. you walk people through what that experience is like? Yeah, it's similar like before you had your first ayahuasca ceremony and you were hearing people to describe ayahuasca and you were like, right. oh, what's that like? And now you have a felt experience and you're like, whoa. Yes. There's something about hearing about an experience totally. and then having an experience. Right. And same thing with the dissociative. Ketamine is a very unique molecule hmm. in that it does give you this, um, somatically it can have it can feel like you're falling. So people describe going into the K hole, like there's this chronic constant feeling of falling back, but not moving. Mm. And psychologically, as you get this dissociative perspective and more of this witness observational platform, it can give you a level of insight because the default mode is where all of our ego defenses live. Right, so the ego's job. Many people, you know, try and say that the ego is bad, or that we right. should try and dominate it, or we should try and you know get over it, or so. I heard somebody say the other day, and it just really landed in a in a sweet spot for me, is that I I transitioned from trying to control my ego to partnering with it, so that mm. we we could become friends. Nice. And I was like, wow, okay, great. So the ego has just helped me survive up to this point. Things, particularly when I was very young, that felt out of control, and my ego defenses started to come into place. So how do I deal with experiences that feel really either threatening or confusing, and I start to interpret meaning from this very small, young child's perspective 
that all this starts to really solidify. And most of the personality is set between by the time we're five to six years old until we start unraveling it and doing, doing our personal development work. So if the ketamine experience is able to come in and give us this dissociative observational platform when the ego is a little bit more calm, the fear centers are a little bit more relaxed, the neurochemistry too can stimulate things called BDNF or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, it, it also stimulates what could potentially be a cleaning up of, up of what's called the uh, glymphatic uh, nervous system. So like the lymphatic system lives in the body, there's a glymphatic system in the brain. Hmm. So it might actually go up and clean some of the neuroreceptors, get some of the junk out of the way. Um, it could even stimulate new neuronal connections and optimize neurochemistry so that the depression becomes more mm, spacious. Right. It's not as locked in, particularly with like a ruminative depression. Mm. So people that do best on ketamine seem to have severe depression. They've tried other things. Oftentimes they're women. And there's a, there's a sense of a ruminative, even suicidal component. So it goes in there and it just stimulates this reboot and this reset. It doesn't, does, it doesn't do the work for us, just like the other medicines. They don't, they don't fix us. It's my belief that the medicines aren't designed to fix us or to cure us. Whatever has stimulated the challenge is still our work to do. It's still important for us to go through that process. Right? It's the difference between giving a man a fish and teaching a man to fish. Right. Right? It's very much my experience that the medicines oftentimes do both. Because oftentimes if we're in the midst of suffering, particularly with treatment-resistant depression, and something comes in and gives us a little space from that, it can feel so relieving. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's still our work to do, which is to understand the causative factors and to reposition ourselves towards a more empowered state of um, personal ownership, personal responsibility to come current and to, to bring our past into the present and to be able to say whatever has happened, how can I come to a sense of metabolizing that experience? And oftentimes that helps to have a guide, a coach, a facilitator, etc. How can I metabolize the emotional content of that experience to be able to come to forgiveness to come to compassion, to come to reconciliation, and then to more clearly be able to see who I am who I am fully and what I'm here to do fully with the unique genius that is me. Because we all have these unique geniuses. There's no Andy, there's no Mike ever on the planet since, nor will there ever be another just like you or just like me. And how do we come into that sense of personal empowerment to actually recognize that we are just as important as anybody and everybody else on the planet? And we have something to give to the collective. And I think it's only when we can come as current through all of our past mm -hmm. and get connected to all aspects of ourselves that we can become even more clear about how to give our best self back for the future days that we have like don howard says welcome to the f you first half of the rest of the first day of the rest of your life yeah it's like okay now because i'm current this can be the first day mm -hmm. of the rest of my life yeah. like it can be a very sweet reboot so ketamine does it in a unique way through this dissociative experience and all the medicines do it from this unique way so mm. my my vision for this whole transformational medicine process is that we have a menu of medicines to work with and that we are sophisticated in our assessment to be able to understand which medicines to use with which person at which time in which sequence of other medicines in a whole person perspective that we're looking at their physiology from a functional medicine lens we're looking at their sociology and all of their relationships and all these different nuances to take a whole person perspective just like you said mm -hmm. and to really more beautifully create the art of medicine back into the the science of a soul-centered approach psyche means soul and, and we as psychiatrists have, really, have largely sold out to the pharmaceutical industry over the last 10 to 20 years to the exclusion of our 
earliest role, which was to be a spokesperson for our client's psyche and their soulful experience. Mm. And so when we talk about like upper, middle, lower, there's a variety of different ways to language this whole person perspective. Yeah. And I think that's what we're on the cusp of. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That looks what a what a holistic, uh, complete healing approach to 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 helping individuals like become their best version of their selves, right? Yeah. I love how you kind of started where you did and then extrapolated it to, yeah, a yes. long way out. Um, my next question would be around the work. So we get these insights into our life from the, the medicine experiences. Um, now. From a psychological background, now, how do you work with the psychology of the individual? Uh, specifically, maybe there's some techniques uh, that you prescribe to people to look at their lives differently or to help do that ongoing day-to-day -day work, which is so required for the, for the true transformation to happen. Mm -hmm. So you're speaking about like in the integration process. In the integration process, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, the integration is the juiciest part, really, because that's where the work is put into action. That's when our, the truth that we receive, like in the peak experience, like Moses coming down with the 12 commandments, you know, oftentimes in the medicine work, we get these very clear directives, mm -hmm. yeah. things to clean up, things to heal, things to do with, you know, key people in our lives, things to look at, things to avoid, things to kind of like get off of the, the menu that maybe was my previous default mm, list mm -hmm. of things that I was relying on to numb myself out from my pain, distract from my pain. Um, personally, for me, I was addicted to a variety of substances before I found the medicine path, and it was very clear that for me to become neurologically on point again, because I was healing half a dozen severe concussions, and psychologically my best version of myself, it was to, be, it was to get completely sober. And then I studied with ayahuasca only for eight years after that. Wow. Completely sober. So it was very much this directive, but it was that whole eight-year process and the integration that that truth became manifested. So if I, if I look at the pie chart, so to speak, of importance, and maybe this isn't fair to do because they're all important, right. it's 10% preparation, 30% experience, and 60% integration. The integration is where we take the, the meditation off the mat, we take the yoga, or the, the yoga off the mat, the meditation off the cushion and make it actionable. Mm. So psychologically, it can be really helpful if people already have a sense of meditation, introspection, self-regulation. That's why I like flotation therapy so much. Flotation is an excellent preparation tool and it's an excellent integration tool. Right. You get people in the tank and they do a series of floats I, I say if you're able to do 10 floats in a 10-week process, you'll be a new human yeah. after yeah. that. It's true you know, sure. we just consistently see that. Everybody yeah. can float. There's no contraindications. Yeah. And it's a really great foundational practice, particularly in the preparation phase, to help people get in touch with the shadow, get in touch with the subconscious material that's going to come up to the surface. If you can't hold yourself together in a float tank, it's going to be hard to hold yourself together in a ceremony. Mm -hmm. So it's a great like barometer to see if you're ready or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the integration with things like that that have a really self-regulatory, reflective meditation kind of quality about them, the integration aspect tends to be more slipstream and, and, and easy. I, I say that because I've seen that just play out when people have some kind of thing to rely on, daily practices, yeah. a lifestyle that's fairly healthy, et cetera. The integration is usually pretty easy. It's super helpful to have a coach, a therapist, a mentor, you know, somebody who can help guide their integration process because I've seen when people do really well, they tend to have support in the integration arena. When people tend to do poorly after a powerful medicine journey, oftentimes they don't have integration support. Mm -hmm. So they start, it's easy for the ego to slip back in and start to doubt everything that was just done mm -hmm. or experienced and say that that was either a pipe dream or you were just like hallucinating or that that thing could never happen or a variety of other excuses. So the ego will slowly come back in and oftentimes, unless we're cataloging the experience in the process itself, we'll actually forget a lot of what happened. So a lot, you know, somewhere between like 70, 
is oftentimes forgotten of the experience itself, like one to two weeks down the road, mm. just like a dream, right? Unless you catalog it immediately, you forget it. And, it, and it's like, poof, it just gone. It's like, what just happened? Mm. Yeah. So if people are able to do that, then they can harvest a lot more. And then it becomes like they're their own spokesperson. They're their own coach and mentor. And if they have support, it's usually just for accountability. So if you can catalog the experience, then you become like your own best teacher. Like I got to do X, Y, and Z. I got to clean, get sober, clean up that relationship. Maybe this job that I've been doing is just like stamping a paycheck and it's not my joy. It's not my passion. Maybe it's time for me to find out what that is. Maybe it's time for me to not live the way I've been living or where I've been living or all these things that can be big lifestyle changes. And so in the integration, that can either feel too daunting or if I wanna just jump straight into it, then it may be really clunky if I'm not doing that in a really good way, in yeah. a way that is sustainable, mm -hmm. in a way that maybe, yes, I need to change up my primary relationship. I may be, maybe I've been in a relationship for five, 10 years and I come out of a, of a medicine experience and I'm like, okay, good, see ya. That's, that's not very kind, it's not very skillful, it's not very compassionate. Versus coming out and saying, wow, I just had this really transformational experience. This is what happened. I, and I want to metabolize the fact that I think maybe we have come from my perspective to the end of our relationship. And I want to do that in a good way. I want to honor like you for spending your precious days, months, and years with me mm -hmm. in this one precious life. I want to give a lot of gratitude and reflection. I want to close up as well as we hopefully started and when one thing we don't do in the west very well is we don't end things really well mm -hmm. we start we're super excited <laughs> and then we jump to the next little lily pad or chase the next shiny object we don't close things really well yeah and that's a super important thing from both like a psychological perspective and like a soul perspective like you need to develop uh closures on whether it's relationships or projects which are all they're all relationships in a form right because mm -hmm. you have this relationship to whatever you're doing or working on or who you're with etc job and uh, i think that's a really good point i've never really kind of you know articulated it so well it's just yeah. like this practice of closure and closing mm -hmm. Uh, mindfully and, and with conscious awareness, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge point to take yeah. home. And really honoring that person, like you said. It's like they gave yes. you a lot of precious time. It's like, why do we got to like make it such a terrible experience half the, or most of the time most probably? The time. It's, 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 especially with divorces and how ugly they are and it's just destroy people's lives and everything like that. It's like, why can't we just end it amicably somehow? <laughs> right. I mean, easier said yeah. than done, right? Yeah, at times it can be easier said than done. And particularly if... if if you're using a lawyer to help you oh. strategize an exit <sighs> protocol oh. well, that's versus right. a mediator, somebody that's gonna, get, gonna wanna right. open up the dialogue of conversation yeah. and see what is the most equitable way to part. Yeah. And that's not always an easy conversation, but yeah. if you come to a place, if you come from a place of peace right. and cooperation, like media mediators typically do, versus like black antagonism and, white, yeah. and, and competitiveness like lawyers typically do a very different outcome right. yeah and not to mention they're going to be taking as much of your money in the process through that entire thing so you're yeah. paying the lawyers a lot too yeah. um i don't want to let the cat out of the bag but you did mention before a float center is it too early to talk about that that we might be opening up in austin yeah yeah um, what we're, we're going to be opening, so Revive is like the neurologic complement to transformational medicine. Where we're opening up in Austin is the psychologic complement to transformational medicine. And part of that treatment suite is going to be a float center. Awesome. Um, we're still getting the schematic. It looks like, um, I just heard, so I may, I may continue to tease it out a little bit longer because I just heard yesterday that we might have landed a 10,000 square foot facility where we'll have a lot of space to play with. Yeah, that's So huge. at that point, we'll build it out from like one or two pods to probably three or four. Yep. And to build out the, the suite of therapeutic synergistic protocols and treatments that work well together. So if we're doing ketamine therapy, instead of relying on ketamine alone to reset the default mode and needing six to 10 sessions, what happens when you start to pair ketamine with all of these synergistic therapeutics 
and you can get the same effect in two to three, maybe four sessions, right? And you have people for a half a day mm. for two weeks at a time, and it's a different model. It's more of an inpatient, intensive, in, it, intensive outpatient process, Yeah. right? So it's not like you come in, get a therapy, you're out in an hour. It's like, no, you come in for like three to four hours and you do an intensive process mm. to understand more of the, the deep material. Ketamine's convenient that way because it lasts for about an hour. And then you can do other therapeutics kind of stacked on. Mm. Once MDMA and psilocybin become legal, and we will plug those in to this transformational psychology kind of new protocol, mm -hmm. though that's gonna be a little bit different because those are six to eight hour yeah. processes. And that's gonna be a little bit further down the road because there's no right now clinical model for six to eight hour sessions. Um, people will have to pay out of pocket because that's not gonna be re insurance reimbursed. So unfortunately you already have a, a subset of the population that really needs it. Yeah. But what we have the opportunity to do is we have the opportunity to prove a new model using these medicines, ketamine, psilocybin, MDMA, cannabis. What are these? And I consider all of those level one medicines. We were speaking about ayahuasca, San Pedro, peyote. Those are level two medicines. DMT, iboga, level three medicines, right? So these level one medicines, when we can prove that they help heal treatment resistant conditions, like the five primary psychiatric epidemics right now, depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, and pain. And psilocybin, for example, is good for each of those in its own way. Um, if we just took one of those, like how is psilocybin good for addiction? It has an 80% cure rate for nicotine addiction after two to three sessions. This is when in the context of cognitive behavioral therapeutic kind of framework, 80% is huge. Mm right and it's it's excellent for treatment resistant depression ocd the list goes on once we get to prove that these medicines help treat resistant conditions that we don't have great therapeutics for right now and we can show that people experience more fulfillment they experience greater happiness they return to work they're more productive at work there's a cost savings back to the collective, then the insurance companies get interested and curious about it. Right. And then we can scale it out and move it to the masses. Yep. So with any new industry, it starts with proving the model and then scaling it out. Right. Just like with solar. You know, solar panels when they first came out were pretty expensive, but you knew that they you knew you were on to something. Yeah. So once it got proven then we tried to figure out, okay, what's the scalable model to make that work? And now it's becoming more and more affordable. And became, it, be, it makes more and more sense. Um, so I see medicines doing the same thing. And when we bring the therapeutics in a really skillful way together, then I don't think there's going to be another model that's as effective. And I think the medicines are the most effective, efficient, and safe when done well mm. methodology that we have available to us to get clear on who we are and what we're here to do. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a, an amazing, relatively untapped resource. Which is, well, the good thing is with people like yourself and Michael Pollan and you know these people coming out who are very credible in the mainstream and talking about them, it's normalizing these, mm -hmm. these medicines for our, our use. Um, maybe to wrap this up. I was wondering if you could share with us one of your bigger sort of epiphanal experiences that you've ever had, like uh, on a medicine of some type. Like I, before, I was talking about how I had this crazy love bombardment, which just overtook my entire consciousness, which I thought lasted for three minutes, but turned out to be the whole ceremony. Um, I had an experience like that. And I've also had many of these types of experiences. Um, has there been any that have stood out for you that were just mind blowing, like, a, like just epiphanal and it shaped yeah. your life in a different way? Yeah, it's a great question. Two uh, come to mind, and I think they're kind of equally important from my perspective because one helped me heal a very key relationship, and that was my dad. I had always held a bit of resentment because he was a he was always a hard ass when I was growing. I didn't grow up with him, um, but I visited him quite a bit. My he and my mom separated when I was about one, and I just had this constant like need to get his approval. And he was a self-made guy and didn't give his approval very 
uh, easily. And so if I had a, you know, A minus or a B plus, it was like, why didn't you get, why didn't I get an A? If I, um, you know, if, if my team, I played soccer for 20 years and all the way through college, and if, and if our team, um, you know, went up to nationals and we won three to one, but my guy scored the one goal, it was like, well, yeah, but your guy scored. I mean, there's always this, it was like, it, it was a lot to kind of prove myself to him. Mm. And I always held a little bit of resentment. And I, I sometimes I was conscious of that and I wasn't always. But in this one medicine experience, I had the opportunity to actually experience his life. Because I knew bits and pieces of it. But it was kind of like you were talking about, you know, I knew bits and pieces of what people describe as an ayahuasca ceremony, yeah. but I'd never experienced one. Yeah. I knew bits and pieces of his life, but I'd never experienced his life. Mm. And I had the opportunity to like be a part of his life when he was a child and to wow. know what his childhood was like and where he came from and why he strove so hard to be self-made and why he was like this like quintessential combination of a CIA agent and the Marlboro man, you know, this wow. really tough <laughs> exterior yeah. um, and hard guy at yeah. times. Right. But when I experienced his life mm. and I knew that everything that he pushed me to for excellence helped serve as a platform for my own excellence now and was all done out of love and all done out of care and consideration, it was just his style of giving it. Maybe it wasn't the style that I wanted, but it was a style that he was able to provide because of where he had come from. And when I understood that and I felt it, I just had massive compassion and massive gratitude. Mm. And I came back from that with a whole new perspective of him in my life. And ever since then, I've had nothing but gratitude. Well, occasionally we get into bickering because sure. we're going to do that, yeah, but just testing, massive yeah. gratitude. Yeah. At what age were you when when that happened? Um, this was one of my first dietas. Okay. And that was about 10 years ago. Okay. And so for the first, and I'm 45 now, and so for the first 35 years, I had a fair bit of resentment. Um, but, you know, it was just because of my own experience as a young person trying to get my dad's approval and that becoming part of my psychological makeup yeah. Yeah. that I wasn't able to really get into that level of compassion. And so that really healed that in that one session. Wow. It really turned, and, and we hear that a lot. I hear that a lot from my friends, family, and clients of them going through medicine experiences and seeing that these, these very pivotal relationships have the opportunity to get healed, oftentimes in just one session because you have such a different existential awareness of that other person's perspective. Huge. Yeah. Um, and you're doing a dieta. Was that during an ayahuasca ceremony while on dieta? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Power, powerful. And the other experience, because you asked me for one, but maybe I won't go into it because that's a bigger story, um, was was a more of an upper world experience and just seeing like the whole... If you got a few minutes, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> on that same dieta, yeah. this this is one of my first early Down dietas. Down in Peru? Yeah. Okay. This is with a medicine called Chitik Sanango. Mm. And Chitik Sanango is known historically for really being a heart opener. And in my prayer, my first prayer going into the medicine, whole medicine world was help me open up my heart. Because I had gone through a separation and a divorce and I couldn't feel it. And I was really cold to my previous partner. And I could see it through her eyes that I was so cold. And I was like, wow, I can't feel this. I don't want to live like that. I, I'm smart enough to know that's not very good. And so the big prayer for me going into the whole medicine arena was help me open up, help me open up my heart. Help me understand this armor and this blockage. And thankfully, I was I, my first real deep, powerful dieta was with Chittik Sanango. I had that experience with my dad. And then I had an experience that was super weird and a bit freaking scary mm. in that another ceremony later in that dieta, this was a three-week dieta, and um, I went back to my tambo after, my tom your tambo's are like your little hut, right? Your maloka's like where everybody goes to do the experience together. You go back to your hut. I went back to my hut, laid in my hammock, and, um, and I'm, you know, wide awake because I usually am after medicine work, waiting for the sun to come up and just listening to the crickets. And I feel this black, tar, sticky goo 
just start at the soles of my feet and work slowly up my whole body. Like I was just sinking while laying down, but sinking into this black tar. And I'm free, you know, fairly freaked out because I'm like, yeah. I don't know what this is or where it's coming and it's coming up my whole body and it comes up my mouth, over my scalp and meets in my third eye and bursts into this vision Whoa. of all of the worst things that we're capable of oh. as a humanity. Whoa. Child torture, rape, molestation, dismemberment, just... Like the darkest stuff. The darkest stuff. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Yeah. I've never seen this. I've never been a part of this. I don't know what this is about. That lasted all for the next several hours, just visions and visions and visions and visions. Wow. And I'm just breathing through as much of it as I can. And it, and, it, and, it, and it starts to loosen as the sun comes up. And then I'm, and then I'm just kind of like stuck with that feeling all day. And into the next day, because we were doing every other day ceremonies at that point. And the next, every other day, the next ceremony, I'm like, I don't know what this one's going to serve yeah. up. If that, and I was just really thrown off. Yeah. So I go into ceremony, have a fairly mild experience, go back to my hut, lay in my hammock. And then the same kind of process happens from the soles of my feet up to my whole body to my third eye, but this time it was light. Whoa. And it was like a crystal, beautiful tapestry of beauty, of, of love, of compassion, of service. And the visions were of, of the most beautiful things we're capable of. And I saw Jesus' ministry in the world and the effect that he had. Wow. On the planetary consciousness, if you believe that Jesus was an actual figure. Sure. But that consciousness um, But that level. consciousness, yeah. right? The Dalai Lama's consciousness, Thich Nhat Hanh, Martin Luther King, um, Mother Teresa, the list goes on. Yeah. Of the most beautiful things that we're capable of as a species and, and that we can do for one another and for ourselves. And it really gave me the juxtaposition. And only at that point... You know, and, and just flooded with tears and flooded with love and flooded with grace. If I had to, one word was like suffering for the first experience and one word was grace for the second experience. And then it started to fade when the sun came up. And as I'm processing these two, I realize that these are just two sides of the same coin, mm. two sides of human experience. And just like Yoda tells Luke Skywalker, in the force, we have the light side of the force and the dark side of the force. We have the light side of humanity and the dark side of humanity, and they're all part of the same humanity. Hmm. It's all part of the same construct that we have been codified in. And we know that the cycle of seasons exists. We know that there is, um, that life is a part, that pain is a part of life, and love is a part of life. And we know that, the, that we can do really shitty things to each other. And we can do really beautiful things to each other and for each other. And, and it is our free will choice to know how we play the game. That we get to choose even if somebody was cruel and mean to me. Like in the Rwandan genocide where 800,000 people died in like a couple of months by butchering and massacre. 94% of people have come to reconciliation. Wow. 94%. So just to know that so many evil, war, bad, like whatever a label, like pain can happen and then my ego creates suffering out of it, I can still turn something like that into forgiveness and grace. And I can still walk in a good way and I can still bring beauty. It's my experience that life isn't meant to be easy, but it is our opportunity to create beauty out of our experience. And so when I had that process, I was like, wow, just blessed with recognizing that that shadow material is in me too. Mm -hmm. I haven't chosen to do those things, but that, that shadow potential resides in all of us. Capable. And, capable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if I know that that's a part of me too, mm -hmm. then if somebody does something to me or somebody I love, I might not agree with it, 
But I can have compassion for the humanity mm. because only somebody that is suffering in deep pain will inflict that kind of pain upon others. And our whole penal system, our whole prison system is completely upside down, right? We put people away who do bad things without understanding the depth of their own pain and really desiring to help them get into reconciliation and healing mm. that. Yeah. So thank you for your question. And it, thank you for just sharing. A, you know, the, the deep process when we go through these experiences, mm -hmm. I think co comes to help orient us to a sense of ultimately wholeness and in integration of all aspects of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty incredible yeah. and an amazing way to, to wrap up the interview. Is there anything that you uh, else you want to get out there today that was on your mind? Top, just anything you want to throw out there? Yeah, I think we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, you, it, I should say a disclaimer, just medically. You know, I, I, I'm passionate about the medicines. And, and not everybody's ready for a medicine experience. Mm. And not everybody's... Um, safe to have a medicine experience right. you know if yes. they're on psychiatric medications have a history of mani mania or psychosis these are powerful tools and i'm also not totally ready to see us pass recreational laws for all these medicines i yeah. think these are powerful yeah. tools and yeah. they need to be respected a lot to learn totally a lot to learn mm -hmm. um so i think that would be the last thing for me to just say cool. is like proceed with mindfulness and and caution. Psychedelic Explorer's Guide is a good book to start with. Jim Fadiman's book. I, I really like him and, and what he shares there. There's a lot of good information on podcasts. And then if people do decide to opt in, know who you're going to sit with, know what you're working with, drop all expectations and trust your own process mm -hmm. yeah. because it opens up for everybody in their own way. That's right. And our an idea of what's supposed to happen, an expectation of what of what should happen, is the biggest handicap yep. that we can put on ourselves going through any medicine process. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think any process yeah. in general. I think right. it's <laughs> totally true. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Really um, smart, cool. Really smart way, especially if you're going to a Peru, like just do your homework and know. And any proper place is going to screen you before you go as well. So yeah. that's like a big like. Yeah. One to watch for. Yeah. No, I just want to quickly just share out um, for Dr. Dan, if you want to connect with him or experience, uh, well, all the different projects and dive into that a little further, it's Dr. Dan Engel, E N G L E dot com, revivecenters.com, spelled C E N T E R S, because that's American, um, and also uh, concussionrepairmanual.com. Um, those are probably the three mm -hmm. main links we can go to. And fullspectrummedicine.com. Oh, perfect. Right. Yeah. Right. That's going to be our growing education and advocacy awesome. platform. Fullspectrummedicine.com. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. Take Check it out. We'll have all the links below for sure. Dan, amazing to finally meet you in yes. person. Thank, Thank you, you so for coming much. in. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great, guys. Very fun. I look forward to the next time. Well, yeah. And until next time. <laughs> to whatever is. To whatever is. All right. Peace.